Welcome, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here today for this event, which is entitled Denise Scott Brown, A Symposium, a straightforward title, I won't say deadpan, about the work of a woman whose career and accomplishments are rich, complex, significant, and impactful. You will be hearing from many accomplished speakers from a broad away, array of institutions over the course of the moderated panels this afternoon. So I am not going to waste precious, precious time with lengthy remarks or introductions. I do wanna thank Frida Gran, both for her work and for bringing her work to Yale, and to thank Richard de Flumery and the school's AT, AT team for their efforts uh, from hospitality to technology so that this will all go smoothly today. I'd like to both thank and welcome our speakers, Mary McLeod, Craig Lee, Valerie Dedelon, Catherine Smith, Leanne Custer, Sylvia Levin, Denise Costanzo, Sarah Moses, Joan Ackman, and Frida Gran herself, along with our moderators, Suri Slavs, Elihu Rubin, and Izzy Kornblatt. And I'm very happy to note that Denise Scott Brown herself will be making the closing remarks following the final panel, thanks to technology. As you read in the program, the three panels tie together varied aspects of Denise Scott Brown's work. They are in sequence, the non-judgmental attitude, learning from three continents, which will follow Mary and Frida's remarks after mine, the city in flux, form, focus, and functions, which will begin at four o'clock, and make no big plans, South Street versus Co-op City, at 6 p.m. 50 years ago, the now famous and oft quoted, even if not always completely understood book, Learning from Las Vegas was published. It grew out of, in part, a studio taught here at the Yale School of Architecture in 1968 by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. In the winter of 2009-10, an exhibition, What We Learned, the Yale Las Vegas Studio and the work of Venturi Scott Brown and Associates were exhibited at the school's gallery upstairs where we'll be having a reception after this event. It included a hundred photographs from Las Vegas taking, taken during the 1968 trip that would underpin the research of Las Vegas by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. In Christopher Hawthorne's New Yorker article in the January 27th issue, so very, very recent, uh, he said, and I quote, what struck me when I went back to reread the book is how deliberately it works to collapse the distance and therefore the distinction between enthusiasm and skepticism and ultimately between documentation and critique. Above all, learning from Las Vegas argues for a curious and open-minded anti-utopianism for understanding cities as they are rather than how planners wish they might be. And then using that knowledge systematically and patiently one as the basis for a new architecture, unquote. And thank you, Christopher. And on that very positive note about what architects and planners can do, let me pass things to Mary McLeod. Perfect. Um, first, a big warm thank you to Deborah and the Yale team, AJ and Richard and all others for holding this symposium and to say how happy I am to be back at Yale. I love these excuses and events. And especially what an honor it is to participate in celebrating Denise Scott Brown's remarkable career and work. And I'm just delighted that she's probably listening in even now. And thank you, Denise. Um, my own role in this event is minor. And I will soon turn the podium over to Frida Graham, who edited the marvelous book that Deborah just showed you. You're probably going to see a lot of it, um, and organized the event. I'd like to begin with this quote from a program Denise wrote in 1966 for a studio she was teaching at UCLA, which Sylvia Levin discusses in her excellent essay, and I believe we'll talk about uh, today. Denise tells her students, the task set is certainly an impossible one. As such, it should be approached with a true sense of adventure 
and with the courage and gaiety of despair. What a line, courage and gaiety of despair. I kind of puzzled about this. Like the studio program that Denise Scott Brown set for her students at UCLA, any attempt to describe her long and multifaceted life as an architect, planner, urban designer, writer, teacher, and mentor is nearly an impossible task. And this symposium, like the book that Frida edited, can only begin to do just that. However, I think that what will become clear is Scott Brown's own conviction to face adversity with courage, gaiety, and a sense of adventure. As an outsider, a woman, Jewish, and a foreigner, Scott Brown has surmounted formidable odds and forged a remarkable career spanning more than 60 years and one that I believe, and it's still going on by the way, and one that I believe has helped change American architecture and studio teaching in fundamental ways. Although she has always been a functionalist to the core and sought as Le Corbusier had before her to make other eyes see if a very different world of freeways, neon signs, strip malls, and mobile homes, and I have a feeling we'll see a lot of those today. Uh, she has brought a concern for social factors and appreciation for, of everyday life and an attention to popular taste and mass culture that countered many of the prevailing norms in architecture. It's also important to stress, I think especially here in a school of architecture, that she helped transform architectural education in radical ways. And considerably before I might mention the famous Yale Las Vegas studio, um, in by 1964 uh, at Penn, she created a new kind of design studio that emphasized urban research and documentation while proposing minimal design interventions. Just as important, she introduced more collaborative, participatory, pluralistic, and interdisciplinary modes of working, challenging the longstanding ethos of competition and the idea of the individual creative genius. And here's a student project from her Form, Forces, and Function studio at Penn, which foreshadows many of the techniques and approaches she would introduce four years later at Yale. And I think we'll hear more about this in Leanne Custer's talk uh, later. Knowledge for Denise has always been something to be collectively gained, not from a master, but from one another, from local residents and from close observation of the surrounding environment. And we hope that this collective effort today, led by Frida, will be in the spirit of her own approach to learning. In my last comments today, and perhaps revealing my own biases and what I, one of the many things I appreciated about Denise, I would like to underscore one dimension of her work that has been less recognized, but emerges as an underlying thread in several of her essays, of the essays in the book and I suspect will also be clear in some of the presentations. And that is Scott Brown's feminism, both her struggle, personal struggle to obtain status and recognition in a white male star studded profession. And you just can't believe what it was like when she began working because it was still like that. And I began school in 72 and her strong commitment to helping other women do the same. As she declared in 1981, she became a feminist mainly because of my quote, experiences in my professional life. And throughout her career in her writings, practice and teaching, she has actively campaigned to change the profession. Her own life, she said, was a quarry, 
And she has not been afraid to draw from her own struggles with discrimination, petty slights, and lack of recognition to write about what must be done to make architecture a more egalitarian, humane, and diverse profession. Sometimes this meant tackling the failure of architects to address the needs, even the smallest, most mundane ones of women in their daily lives. Um, as she did in her marvelous 1967 essay, Planning the Powder Room. And I think women and even some men today what woman uh, today has not experienced some of the frustrations she so wittily described, despite all our constant thinking of what bathrooms should be uh, today. Um, in other instances, it meant confronting head on the culture of the profession itself. As she did in a talk in 1973 at the Alliance of Women in Architecture, and then again in her 1975 essay, Sexism and the Star System, a somewhat shorter version of which was finally published in the feminist anthology, Architecture, A Place for Women in 1989. She attacked the blatant sexism in the profession, the notion of the sole designer on top, the cult of personality, the boys club atmosphere, the exclusion of women at professional gatherings, the press's lack of coverage of women architects, and the glass ceiling that prohibited women's advancement. Um, and I'm gonna, just a moment. Going back to that second quote, uh, you might note the use of the words me too, uh, this was already, uh, as I said, in the 70s. Um, in so many ways, she foreshadowed concerns that uh, I think are important to us today. Uh, she attacked the blatant sexism in the profession, the notion of the sole designer on top. Oh, I just said all that, sorry. Moreover, it probably doesn't hurt to repeat, but let's, <laughs> okay. Moreover, in contrast to many women architects of her generation, she did not take pride in being a quote, exceptional one. Indeed, she delighted in the rise of women in the field in the mid, mid 1970s and how the talent and enthusiasm of these young women, as she wrote, has burst creativity into the profession. But she was also a hardcore realist about their prospects recognizing that they too would face discrimination. And she urged them to have a quote, feminist awareness as they confronted professional obstacles. On her practice with Robert Venturi, Scott Brown wrote an essay in 2007 that's published in her marvelous little book published by the AA, Having Words. And in it, she wrote using heart, mind and artistry, we still hope naively, like Arthur Korn, her mentor and teacher at the AA, to do good and achieve beauty. And I look forward to learning more today about how Scott Brown sought to do just that. Now, before we turn it over to Frida, I would like to introduce her briefly, um, and then we'll get on with her remarks about the conference. Um, Frida Grant is an architect, editor, architecture critic, and architectural historian. She holds two master's degrees from ETH after getting her undergraduate degree uh, in Sweden. Um, the first is a master in architecture, the second in advanced studies in the history and theory of architecture. Her writings have appeared in journals, and forgive my bad German accent, Architesi, Werk, Bauen and Wohnen, and Architektur, among others. In addition to her work as an architect and project manager in Swiss architectural firms, she has lectured widely in Switzerland, Sweden, and Germany. 
She also, while she was finishing up this book, and I can't believe her energy, uh, co-curated the exhibition called Territory as Palimpsest, The Legacy of Andre Corbeau. And for those of you, and this was held at the University, the Academy of Architecture in Mendrisio. And for those of you who don't know Andre Corbeau, um, he was an urban theorist, uh, writer, uh, and um, I think Frida could tell us some interesting parallels uh, with his concerns with Denise. She's now writing her doctoral thesis at in Madrid and Mendrisio called The Swiss Reception of Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown. And I was at first kind of puzzled, is there enough? Um, but in fact, I discovered talking to her and also to Stani von Mose, who was always telling me how much postmodernism there was in Switzerland. I didn't quite believe him. Um, that there really was a very serious, interesting reception of uh, Venturi and Scott Brown's work. And I just accidentally moved to Frida's slide. She is the editor of the anthology of this book, Denise Scott Brown in Other Eyes, Portraits of an Architect, published by Burkhauser uh, this past fall. And we keep hoping it will appear in the US. It's actually sitting in a warehouse in Tennessee, but um, computer programs don't seem to let it out. Anyway, Frida, thank you so much for organizing this event and um, we look forward to it. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Mary. That was amazing. I'm very, very touched. And thank you very much, uh, Dean Burke, as well, for your introduction. So I am incredibly honored and delighted to be here today for the symposium uh, to celebrate the life and career of Denise Scott Brown. Um, the symposium is built on the anthology Denise Scott Brown in Other Eyes, Portraits of an Architect, um, published on the 50th anniversary of learning from Las Vegas uh, last year, so a couple of months ago, still working on the distribution in the US. Uh, this is the first opportunity to reflect on Denise Scott Brown's work and continue to develop the ideas we explored in this book together. And after having worked separately on different continents, three different continents, in fact, for two years, um, it is wonderful to see so many of the authors in person. Um, and uh, as Mary pointed out, the more common order to do things would have been to organize a symposium first, and then <laughs> to publish the papers afterward. Mm, but this time we do it the other way around. So we have nine um, of the 24 contributors uh, with us in person uh, and one, the main character on Zoom. So Denise Scott Brown, thank you for taking the time to be with us virtually today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, as we've said, the, the symposium marks the anniversary of learning from Las Vegas, but the book and the studio will not be the main topic of discussion today, probably, we'll see. Um, and one important reason for this is that this has already been done 13 years ago in January 2010, a three, the three-day conference Architecture After Las Vegas, organized by Stanislaus von Moos, uh, took place here at Hastings Hall, where we are, are standing, sitting. And quite a few of you were present at that event uh, as well. I, I was not, unfortunately, but I heard uh, many good things about this event. Um, as were Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, uh, who, as you know, sadly passed away in 2018. And the conference papers were published uh, in this book, I That Saw Architecture After Las Vegas in 2020. And there were also two exhibitions, as Dean Burke uh, mentioned here at Rudolf Hall. Um, so what we will we'll do here today is not to discuss the Las Vegas studio or the book per se, but to contextualize 
it in Scott Brown's intellectual universe by looking at what took place before in parallel and after the seminal, seminal work. Um, we will talk um, indirectly about Las Vegas, can say, how its lessons can be applied um, not to build casinos, uh, but to save small towns, for instance. So we will look at civil rights and social justice, uh, taking as Brown's message to heart that the Las Vegas studio was, was as much a social project as it was about form. So the focus will be on Denise Scott Brown. Um, and although the Las Vegas project was heavily indebted to her ideas, she has so far only sparingly been subject to scholarly attention. Her contributions have long remained unrecognized or wrongly attributed. And in my conversations with Denise, as she prefers to be called, um, which have taken place during my doctoral research at Academia di Architettura in Mendrisio, she has often struck me with amazement. So doors kept opening to unexpected fields, and I realized how little is commonly known about her. So there are still unknown sides to her thinking, and few commentators have gone beyond the well-known catchwords. So we will highlight Denise's conceptual contributions, her distinct voice and incisive impact on architectural education, urban planning and design. And I won't say much more about the book, but this is what we're doing in the book as well. Uh, and for a more detailed introduction to the book, you are cordially invited to a talk, uh, which will take place this Friday uh, at the Center for Architecture in New York. And the talk is with Lynn Dilbert, who uh, a photographer who took this amazing uh, photograph, this, this portrait of, of Denise Scott Brown in 1978, uh, with Kathleen McKeegan, um, George Thomas, Susan Snyder, and me, uh, moderated by Mary McLeod. So, um, and for those of you who would like to buy the book, um, your distribution is underway and there's also a 20% discount uh, actually if you ask for, for the code, there's a code. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay. So today's symposium is building on chapters from the book, but not duplicating it. Nine chapters will be presented, organized in three panels, uh, moderated by Sorry Slash Labs, um, Elihu, Ruben, and Issy Kornblatt. The first panel, um, yeah, okay. So the first uh, panel, the non-judgmental attitude, learning from three continents, gives us a foundation to Scott Brown's worldview, shaped on three continents, which led to a non-judgmental attitude comparable to camp, pop art, and mannerism, and which characterizes her way of seeing uh, Las Vegas. And the panel includes contributions by Craig Lee, Valerie Didelon, and Catherine Smith. Uh, the second panel, the city in flux, form, forces, and functions, um, here we will share new scholarship on the studio methods developed by Scott Brown during her teaching career in the early 60s, looking at how, how these methods were used before the Las Vegas studio. And the panel includes papers by Leanne Custer, Sula Levin, and Denise Costanzo. And the third panel, Make No Big Plans, South Street versus Co-op City focuses on the apparent discrepancy between different scales of planning and grades of intervention. Here we see rejuvenation of all commercial districts, projects which have received little attention, but are at the core of Scott Brown's early work. Uh, and we have uh, papers by Sarah Moses, John Ackman, and myself. And last but not least, concluding comments will be offered by Denise Scott Brown herself. So before I hand over to the first panel, I wish to extend my warm thanks to Dean Burke and the School of Architecture for hosting this important event and for this opportunity to engage with the Scott Brown's universe. I wish to thank A.G. Artemel and Richard de Fumieri for the excellent organization. Thanks to uh, Vincent Guerrero, David Liston uh, for technical support. And I thank Associate Dean Phil Bernstein uh, and Terence Brown for the invitation. 
Um, I thank the authors uh, who are our speakers today for their excellent scholarship. Today is a day of celebration. <laughs> Um, editing this book and, and convening this symposium has been a privilege and a delight. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, special thanks also go to Mary McLeod again <laughs> for her invaluable support and editorial advice throughout this project. Uh, it's been a tireless, joyful collaboration. <laughs> so, um, of course, I also want to thank the moderators uh, who I will briefly introduce. Sarish Lab's work explores the aesthetic qualities of shared experience, engaging uh, a range of socially charged and participatory aesthetic and political practices characterized by their distinctly public character and socially intensive contexts. His doctoral, um, doctoral dissertation, Waiting for Architecture, John uh, Devey and the uh, Dive and the uh, Limits of Modern Art concerned the specific relevance of Dive's pragmatism, philosophy, and pedagogy to the evolution of aesthetic modernism in the middle decades of the 20th century. And here at Yale, he directs the undergrad major in architecture. Um, for the second panel, we have Elihu Rubin. Elihu Rubin uh, is the Associate Professor of Urbanism here at Yale School of Architecture, where he teaches architecture history, urban studies, and urban design. And he directs the Yale Urban Media Project, a New Haven-based public scholarship initiative, and is Director for Advocacy and Planning at the Yale uh, Urban Design Workshop. And we have Issy Kornblatt, for the last panel, who is an architectural critic and historian, currently pursuing a PhD in the history and theory of architecture here at Yale. He serves as a contributing editor at Architectural Record. He studied at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he received his 2000, 2019 thesis prize. Um, and he has contributed to several books published in a variety of publications um, and curated to exhibitions. So, with this, I wish you all an inspiring afternoon. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you to those who are listening uh, at home. And uh, I hand over the floor to Suri. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Frida. Okay, uh, welcome all. Um, in her landmark essay on pop art, permissiveness and planning, just one of many delightfully alliterative titles that Denise Scott Brown devised, um, Scott Brown describes the creative impulse as an act of trying to like what one does not like, or what we refer to here today as embracing a non-judgmental attitude. Just as Clace Oldenburg and Pop had expanded the definition of art to include vestiges and echoes of the everyday world around us, learning from Las Vegas would expand that of architecture, or rather, it would expand the array of questions concerns, objects, and places deemed worthy of the architect's attention, fundamentally changing what it means to think and see and act in the world as an architect. The nature of this change was presciently and quite beautifully, I think, described by Alan Capro, a frequent collaborator and intellectual sparring partner of Oldenburg's in 1958's essay, The Legacy of Jackson Pollock through which Capro sought to chart a path for himself and others out from under the stultifying strictures of a pervasive and totalizing formalism. Art had changed, Capro insisted. It had evolved beyond the specific media of disciplinary and painterly practice. And in the coming decade, he wrote, young artists would find that all of life is now open to them. They will discover out of ordinary things the true meaning of ordinariness. They will not try to make them extraordinary, but will only state their real meaning. But out of nothing, they will devise the extraordinary and then maybe nothingness too. People will be delighted or horrified. Critics will be confused or amused, but these I am certain will be the alchemies of the 1960s. 10 years later in 1968, with the leaden weight of history swiftly crashing down, around, and upon us, something golden, something revolutionary would indeed emerge from the alchemical stew of so much cultural flotsam. 
This revolution wasn't strictly aesthetic or disciplinary, though it was both of those things to one degree or another. Rather, it was the culmination of a revolution in education and learning. Learning from Las Vegas put forward a vision of architectural education as an essentially social, collectively driven activity, embodying an understanding of architectural knowledge constructed not by appeal to authority, be that authority a person, a precedent, a method, or some nugget of received wisdom, but through critical and creative engagement with a wide range of essentially different, potentially unlikable others, of architectural education as an active and ever-changing process of inquiry by which students aren't told what to think, but are shown out in the desert, out on the strip, camera in hand, how to think. The question of how architects think, how they learn to see, and how Denise Scott Brown in particular learned to think and see concerns in some way each of the three speakers comprising this afternoon's first panel on the non-judgmental attitude. Leading off today will be Craig Lee, the Rice Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow in Architecture and Design at the Art Institute of Chicago. Craig is a PhD candidate in art history at the University of Delaware, earned his master's degree at the Bard Graduate Center, and his bachelor's degree at Dartmouth College. Joining us from France this afternoon and next to the plate will be the architecture critic and historian Valérie Dillon. He is Professor of Theory and Design at the École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture de Normandie. He is co-founder and editor of the mag magazine Criticat and is a contributor to many architecture journals. He is also fittingly the author of several books, including La Controverse, Learning from Las Vegas. Finally, Catherine Smith is Professor of Art History at Agnes Scott College. Her research focuses on intersections in American art and architecture from the 1960s to the present with emphases on sculpture and urbanism. Let's give them all a warm welcome. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to Dean Burke and the Yale School of Architecture and my deep thanks to Frida for the both and ordinary heroic work to put this volume on Denise Scott Brown together from which my talk is based. And just on a personal note, I just wanna say that Leanne Custer and I first met in 2015 at St. Francis de Sales, a church in West Philadelphia, where in 1969, Venturi Scott Brown designed an altar using neon and plexiglass. Uh, with Leanne's phone, I took a picture of her and Denise Scott Brown who attended the event and Leanne and I have, Leanne and I have been friends since. And I just state that as one of many examples for how Denise Scott Brown has brought people together over the years and all of us here today. 12 years after the 1972 publication of Learning from Las Vegas, written by Robert Venturi, Denise Scott Brown, and Steven Eisenhower, Scott Brown wrote, mine is an African view of Las Vegas. Her statement emphasized her perspective on the project reiterated in subsequent writings and interviews, she was calling attention to her individual biography. This African view, a term explored in this talk, reflected her upbringing in Johannesburg, as well as her transnational experience as a South African national, student in London and Philadelphia, an American immigrant and then American citizen. It also embodied a position continually on the margin that had a formative role in her work and thinking about the everyday cultural landscape. This consideration of Scott Brown's place-based biography uncouples her from her co-authors in Learning from Las Vegas to detail a way of looking at the American built environment and her leading contribution to this influential study. Learning from Las Vegas, the 1968 Yale Architecture Studio, the 1972 first edition, the 1977 revised edition and the 2017 facsimile edition was a career defining project and a landmark in architectural discourse. In brief, the authors studied the signs and symbols on the Las Vegas Strip to understand the iconography of the city's commercial vernacular. The mainstream reality of Main Street held important lessons for contemporary architecture and urbanism. Their opening line was a critical salvo. Learning from the existing landscape 
is a way of being revolutionary for architects. If the call was for revolution, then it was Scott Brown who led the charge. She designed the studio programs and work topics. Eisenhower later attested to the primacy of her role, quote, the Las, Vegas project, the Las Vegas project was totally dependent on Denise for the intellectual rigor of it, unquote. So much so that some early manuscripts placed her name first, though for various reasons, the publication ended up leading with Venturi. And the intent here is not to claim Scott Brown as the sole or true author of Learning from Las Vegas, but rather to focus on what she brought to and out of the Las Vegas studio, study, publication, and its reception. And it's an effort to discern Scott Brown's call for the concept of joint creativity in recognition of her work and practice and also in partnership with Venturi. From an early age, Scott Brown was attuned to architecture. Born on October 3rd, 1931 in Nakana, Northern Rhodesia, Scott Brown was the eldest of Shim and Phyllis Lakovsky's four children. The Lakovsky family moved from the rural mining wilderness to the suburban and urban environs of Johannesburg when she was two years old. Her parents enrolled her at Kingsmead College, a private girls primary and secondary school in Melrose, a northern suburb of Joburg. Shim Lakovsky was a successful real estate developer who Scott Brown recalled walking Johannesburg with an eye to property speculation. Her mother though was most vital she would drive Scott Brown and her sister around Johannesburg looking mainly at houses. Phyllis Lakovsky had studied architecture for two years at the University of Witwatersrand, and then in 1934, commissioned a modernist house for the family from the practice of one of her classmates, Norman Hansen. Johannesburg in this period was a vibrant site of the modern movement. Hansen, along with others like Rex Martiansen and Gordon McIntosh, ensured a robust exchange and practice of the international style. For example, in a 1936 letter, Le Corbusier wrote to Martiansen about his high regard for the architectural scene in Johannesburg. One is amazed to find something so vital emanating from a distant point in Africa, which lies far beyond the equatorial forests. Growing up in an international style house, Scott Brown reminisced, I climbed its steel columns and played ships on its spiral stair and deck. You can have mythic illusions and houses with flat roofs, and you can also play on the roof. In this way, her exposure to the larger architectural trends and modernist ideas of the period was personal and experiential and a foundation of her identity to this day. When Scott Brown enrolled in the architecture program at Witz in 1949, she surrounded herself with a group of progressively minded students that would become architectural emigrants themselves. Robert Scott Brown, her first husband, Diana Evanary, then Goldstein, she was a key advocate in the fight to save Penn Station in New York, and Robin Middleton, a professor of architectural history at Columbia University. Together, they planned an exhibition during her third year titled Man-Made Johannesburg. This activity engaged the skills her mother taught her in childhood to look openly and critically at the surrounding built environment. The exhibition and experience with its survey of buildings in Johannesburg from the 1910s to 1940s is a key example of a lifelong frame of viewing that would carry to Las Vegas. And on this slide are some of the recent modern buildings that they might have seen that were part of the metropolitan fabric. In contrast to the urbanism of Johannesburg and the vast rural veld expanses in the Macapan, a three hour drive to the north, Scott Brown learned many important lessons from camping and fossil hunting trips. Quote, eventually I came to compare our wilderness landscapes with the city, feeling that both established complex laws with or without our intervention, unquote. This landscape, climate and geography helped to foster a design approach that was mindful of environmental conditions. But the Veld also became a touchstone for questioning cultural and colonial identity. From an early age, she noted the disjuncture between her physical reality and the colonial ideal shaped by media. As a child, I too saw almost exclusively English places in the books I read. I lived in a harsher, drier landscape. And although I found the High Veld incredibly beautiful, English people around me seemed to like it only to the extent that it reminded them of home. Why, I wondered, must my landscape look like Surrey to be beautiful? And I became an African xenophobe. This disjuncture, this African xenophobia, 
that suggested an aversion to the South African landscape, even though she found it beautiful, was radicalizing. That is, growing up as a South African in a former colony still dominated by English culture, Scott Brown perceived and resisted what she saw as colonial ideologies dismissive of South African surroundings and experiences. Her African xenophobia was a term that described a, a British expat xenophobia in South Africa that became a powerful cautionary tale for her dismissing everyday experiences and instead to find their value. It was an early experience of is and ought, a binary framework from which she would later learn from social scientists at the University of Pennsylvania and could be used to explain these conflicting cultural value systems. In this case, the is of the colony and the ought of the mother country. Simply put, she asked herself, where did we fit culturally and artistically with Africa or with England? And the complex social, racial, and personal conditions that were Scott Brown's life in Johannesburg were critical to her outlook, in one sense peripheral to the colonial metropole, and in another still very privileged in its local context as a white upper middle class citizen. And yet growing up Jewish, a reason she was bullied at school amidst the specter of Nazism in Europe and as a white person in apartheid South Africa, it also made her question the simple strictures of dogma and ideology. In response to a question about being conscious of these humanistic issues in her work, Scott Brown was unequivocal, quote, very much so, because you can't be South African and not be conscious of it, unquote. Her status as an outsider in these various ways left her not so much on the outside looking in, but rather on the outside looking around. In the 1986 essay, Invention and Tradition about the nature of American architecture and drawing parallels with her own history, she detailed her process of her approach, and I'm going to read from the highlighted on the left. It was relatively easy to transfer my African xenophobia, African attitude to America, and to suggest that American architects, for the sake of cultural relevance and artistic vitality, look at the landscape around them and learn. Scott Brown has used the phrase, an African view, to describe an important part of herself and how her position on various cultural and colonial edges informed her perspective, especially on Las Vegas. When this 1986 essay was republished in 2009, Scott Brown added a sentence highlighted in orange that reinforced her point of view. In that sense, mine is an African view of Las Vegas. And on one hand, an African view describes a way of seeing, of valuing the objects, places, and spaces that exist in one's everyday life and locale. And on the other hand, her African view comprised a lived experience in Johannesburg as a white South African, crossing with complex realities of race and ethnicity. Part of her African view then included her experience with the local and folk architecture of the Mapoke and Debele people who built mud houses with thatch roofs and painted the exteriors with colorful geometric patterns based on both indigenous and adopted motifs. Scott Brown admired their complex incorporation of traditional residential typologies, response to forced planning ordinances, and sort of hybrid Gillette razor blade graphics. She, uh, Scott Brown knew Betty Spence, a white South African whose research program at WITS led to numerous studies and articles, such as the July 1954 Architectural Review cover article, Mpoga, which featured these dwellings and validated her own experience in South Africa. A moment that for Scott Brown represented the is and the ought as the same. So this visual and social acuity to culture, popular, local, focal, and vernacular would continue to occupy Scott Brown as part of her African view. In 1952, Scott Brown went to London for her fourth year practicum at WITS. She enrolled at the Architectural Association School of Architecture and completed her diploma in 1955. And that year she married Robert Scott Brown who had joined her in London at the AA. He was the son of a Scottish immigrant lawyer and Presbyterian father and half Jewish mother who grew up on a farm in Natal and spoke English, Zulu, German, and later added French, Italian, and a little Serbian. She was the Jewish granddaughter of ethnic Latvians and Lithuanians, immigrants to Rhodesian lion country in South Africa, who grew up well-to-do in suburban Johannesburg, near where Robert lived. And together, they shared a fervent idealism about architecture in South Africa, with the goal to return and, quote, give something back, unquote. 
They returned to South Africa in 1957 and turned their attention to survey the vast multicultural and diverse country in which they plan to work. This photographic practice of close observation and documentation of architecture and the built environment was instructive, providing a rich index of the dwellings, landscapes, and patterns of living in South Africa. And however, however despite their education, travel, and work abroad, the Scott Browns still wanted more training to equip them for their future work as architects in South Africa. In 1958, the Scott Browns set off for Philadelphia to begin their master's degrees in city planning at the University of Pennsylvania. Scott Brown thrived at Penn through intellectual circumstance. Sociologist Herbert Gans had a powerful impact and eventually practical necessity. In June of 1959, Robert died in a car accident. Uncertain of the future, she threw herself into her studies and recalled, I returned to school in the fall because no alternative seemed better. She received her city planning degree in 1960, and though she had always intended to return to South Africa because Robert intended to return, instead she joined the faculty as an assistant professor. She simultaneously taught and studied for a master's of architecture degree, which she received in 1965. That year in 1965, Scott Brown moved to California to teach at Berkeley and then UCLA. When she invited Robert Venturi to be a visiting critic in 1966, she took him to see Las Vegas, a city that she had already visited four times. They had first met as colleagues at Penn in 1960 and had since been seeing each other. 1967 was a momentous year for Scott Brown. She received tenure, became a naturalized US citizen and married Venturi. In 1968, when Venturi was the named endowed Charlotte Shepard Davenport Visiting Professor of Architecture and Scott Brown was merely a visiting professor of urban design. With the help of a graduate assistant, Steven Eisenhower, they conducted the studio, learning from Las Vegas, or form analysis as, as design research. In the United States, Scott Brown applied the lessons that began in South Africa. She was uniquely qualified to see Las Vegas in a way that others hadn't or couldn't. Venturi acknowledged as much in a profile of his wife, quote, Venturi concedes that as an outsider, as a South African, Scott Brown helped him re-see the American landscape, unquote. In his 1991 Pritzker Prize acceptance speech, thanking the people, places, and institutions influential in his career, Venturi named Las Vegas as one such place, clarifying, which I learned via the perspective of Rome and through the eyes of Denise Scott Brown. Scott Brown had a natural disposition to appreciate and see the strong correspondence between the boomtown desert urbanism of both Johannesburg and Las Vegas, just as her childhood trips to the Veld allowed her to see the complex laws and shared relationships between the rural and urban. There in Las Vegas, she found a similar rich contrast and the same urge to understand it. If Scott Brown helped Venturi, to re-see the American landscape because of her South African viewpoint. And if, as Eisenhower noted, she provided the intellectual rigor to the project, then the change between the 1972 and 1977 edition comes into relief. It's a realignment towards Scott Brown's critical role. Indeed, she led the graphic design. For example, the first figure in the 1977 revised edition on the top right is a photograph of the signs on the Las Vegas Strip taken through an automobile windshield photographed by Scott Brown. And this replaced an illustration of 19th century eclecticism from Loudon's Encyclopedia, in the 1972 edition. And so this revised edition, it brings it closer to the original project intent laid out in their 1968 article which also featured a similar Las Vegas strip photograph taken by Scott Brown. It also reorients the project to Scott Brown's mode of seeing that first began with her mother, driving her and her sister around Johannesburg. In Las Vegas too, Scott Brown was a passenger, now with camera in hand, as Venturi drove them through the streets. While a photo credit line may read as firm in terms of authorship, a practice of photography, a way of looking together is not. That is to say, Venturi steering the vehicle is as contingent as Scott Brown shooting the target, a dual coincident. One cannot happen without the other. And finally, 
Learning from Las Vegas doesn't just bear her imprint in terms of the ideas, images, or appearance, but also in feeling. The first edition is dedicated to Cecilia and George, Robert Scott Brown's mother and stepfather. The revised edition is dedicated to the memory of Robert Scott Brown. For all the publication's initial impact and subsequent influence, learning from Las Vegas was deeply personal. In this way, South Africa is at the heart of the study because it was guiding. And after the tragic loss of Robert Scott Brown, it was a geography that led in new directions, Philadelphia, Las Vegas, and beyond. The book can be seen as a testament to Denise Scott Brown's talent and determination to still succeed in carving out a life and career in architecture that she had imagined otherwise. In 2011, Scott Brown received an honorary degree from Vitz, from which she unintentionally left unfinished when she set off for London so many years ago. With hindsight, she saw it as a turning point, quote, in this way at 20, I left home, family and country for good without actually realizing it, unquote. In her commencement address, she continued, ironically, I have used what I learned for South Africa in France, England, Japan, Morocco, China, and America, but I have not taken it to you. Even her initial writings highlight this facility with her multiple identities. Her first two articles in 1962 and 64 um, reviewed planning models for the city of Philadelphia and then the planning model for the Natal province in South Africa. As an outsider on different margins, she has been able to move between worlds and use this experience to create new ones and to help us continually re-see ours. Let me end on how she sees from where she stands in her own words. My intimacy with several cultures while young helped me to do my work in these places, though the African in me still asks, what am I doing here? Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you very much. First of all, I, I would like to, to thank Frida Grant for inviting me to join you from Paris uh, in this symposium about the work of uh, Denise Scott Brown, whom I salute warmly. And I would like to thank the Yale School of Architecture for housing this very opportune event. Um, so as I was invited almost two years ago to contribute in the publication of Denise Scott Brown in Other Eyes, I suggested to Frida Grant that I could shed some light on Denise's important contribution to American intellectual life by relating a writing with one of Suzanne Sontag. Can I have the next slide, please? So as seen here, both women had their picture taken in a similar fashion by Lynn Gilbert in the late 1970s in the context of the publication of the book we already mentioned, Particular Patients Talk with Women Who Shape Our Time. So one could say that at first glance, a lot separates Denise from Susan Sontag, whom I believe never met each other. While the former has endlessly fought elitism in the field of architecture, the latter has been the embodiment of the very same elitism in the field of literature, art, and criticism. Denise Cadbron is first and foremost a professional who worked for half a century to change practices in architecture urban design and pedagogy. Susan Sontag was a pure intellectual, a novelist of avant-garde fictions and a sophisticated essayist who stayed out of academic circles. In Philadelphia, Denise worked closely with Bob Venturi within the VSBA architectural community that she always promoted, while Susan Sontag was a prima donna of the New York High Society. But Denise, Scott Brown, and Susan Sontag also have things in common. They were both born within the same years and received their intellectual training in the late 50s in the, at the, in the best American university, Berkeley and Chicago for Sontag, Upen for Denise. In their respective domains, they actively participated in the great upheavals that marked the 1960s and 1970s in the US before becoming key figures of the American culture in the late 20th century. Next slide, please. But as I will try today to find resonances in the works of Denise and Susan Sontag, 
I will do it specifically from the examination of two essays, which the two women published a few years apart, Notes on Camp and Learning from Las Vegas, two essays that have made them in an, in an instant famous and outrageous. My main hypothesis is that the idea of camp might help us to understand better what learning from Las Vegas did to American culture, and is that conversely, Denise and Bob writing on Las Vegas are fueling the thesis defended by the 30 years old Susan Sontag in Not, Notes on Camp. Next slide, please. So let me remind you first what Susan Sontag said about camp from the 58 aphorisms she published in Partisan Review during the fall 1964. She explained that camp is both a sensibility which concerns an observer and a quality that applies to the object that he or she observes. On the sensibility side, it is one way of seeing the world and as an aesthetic phenomenon. On the quality side, side the hallmark of camp is the spirit of extravagance, the excess, the too much. In respect to the observer, camp sensibility is disengaged, depoliticized, or at least apolitical, say it sometimes. One could add non-judgmental. The camp object, on the other hand, is characterized by, by a seriousness that fails. Sontag claimed that there is only true camp in the combination of sensibility and quality. Camp implies having a sense of irony to the extent that behind the straight public sense in which something can be taken, artifacts and people always play a role. Camp sees everything in quotation mark. It's not a lamp, but a lamp. It's not a woman, but a woman. And above all, as Sontag put it, Kem says that there is a good taste of bad taste. The ultimate slogan being, it's good because it's awful. Kem's sensibility belongs to an historical moment, the mid 1960s, but it clearly has antecedents and maybe successors. Sontag explained that Kemp is a modern dandyism. Camp is the answer to the problem how to be a dandy in the age of mass culture. The connoisseur of camp indeed shows aristocratic tendencies, even if it takes enjoyment in the coarsest, commonest pleasures in the art of the masses. Camp shares certain attributes with kitsch, but it has more irony and self-awareness. At best, kitsch is naive camp. Pop which is also a sensibility from the 1960s, has some similar similarities with camp, but it, is, it lacks for its part a bit of love for its object. Pop, is, pop art is more flat and more dry, more serious, more detached, ultimately nihilistic. Then what about architecture? As Sontag put it in her third aphorism, there are campy movies, clothes, furniture, popular songs, novels, people, and buildings. Next slide, please. Considering this, with all the fleshy casinos and hotels, funny wedding chapels, and glittering giant billboards that sprung along the strip, Las Vegas had it all to become the mecca of camp. However, if I believe Benjamin Moses' recent biography, Susan Sontag has never paid a visit to the so-called Sin City, or has shown any interest into it. She liked Paris. As a matter of fact, very few American intellectuals granted importance to Las Vegas in the mid 1960s, aside from Tom Wolfe, who wrote about it a thrilling and well known article for Esquire magazine. Before, Denise Colburn was a forerunner when she patrolled the strip for the first time in 1965, just a few months after the publications of Notes on Camp. She was actually predisposed to take a comprehensive look at the Gaudi constructions since she had mingled with the new brutalist in England in the 1950s. From that earlier experience, Denise learned that beauty can be derived from hard reality and that facing uncomfortable facts can sharpen the eye and refine one's aesthetic ability. As she brought Bob Venturi to Las Vegas, 
Denise shared with him a rule-breaking rule breaking outlook to aesthetic on her interest in two ugly things. In particular, patients, the book we already mentioned, Denise remembered days by the desert sun and days old by the signs, both loving and hating what we saw, we were jolted clear out of our aesthetic skin. Next slide, please. As an outcome of this moving experience, Learning from Las Vegas was first published in March 1968 in the Architectural Forum. As I already suggest, I believe this essay could be read, could be read as a manifestation of the camp sensibility. However, it is not explicit. Firstly, Denise and Bob actually considered Las Vegas as a purely visual phenomenon, if not an aesthetic one, as they describe an architecture of styles and signs. Furthermore, their study of the strip and beyond, beyond that of the commercial boulevard focused on the more extravagant of its landmarks from Roman style casino to a giant electrographic sign. Secondly, the two architects' gaze could be described as camp in as much as it seems to be non-judgmental, depoliticized, and amoral. Indeed, both make, made it clear on several occasions that they should not be bothered for a lack of social commitment. Steadfast in keeping the different concerns apart, they insisted that the morality of commercial advertising, gambling interest, and the competitive instinct is not at issue here. Next slide, please. Thirdly, the second part of learning from Las Vegas that was first published in the Architectural Forum during the fall 1971 sounds explicitly camp as Denise and Bob playfully juggle with good and bad taste. They praised the ugly and ordinary architecture as they listed the features of the guild house that was designed by Bob Venturi in the early 60s. I quote them. The technologically an advanced brick, the old fashioned double hung windows, the pretty materials around the entrance and the ugly antenna not hidden behind the parapet in the accepted fashion. And yet, the design of the building's facade is clearly elaborated, full of artifice. Obviously, the guild house is rather camp than kitsch, not naive at all. Somehow, in learning from Las Vegas, Denise and Bob often saw things in quotation marks. It's an antenna, it's a duck, it's a monument, it's Las Vegas. Behind the straight public sense, everything plays a role and travels the audience. In this way, learning from Las Vegas is a masterpiece of wit and irony. But I insist, the two authors were, were by no means nihilist and showed true consideration and even love for the artifacts of the American roadside they studied. The way they look at it was obviously camp rather than pop. Next slide, please. If Denise and Bob never claimed to have a camp view on commercial architecture, and I guess Denise will confirm that today, the study of the reception of learning from Las Vegas is suggesting that its readers thought so. For instance, Thomas Maldonado, Martin Pauley, and Kenneth Frampton, who have often blamed the Venturi for showing interest in the bad taste of the silent majority, the white lower middle class praised by Richard Nixon, have also complained about I quote, the camp cult of the ugly and ordinary. But it is, it, it, is, it is Charles Jenks in Modern Movement in Architecture who picked up more accurately Sontag's idea as he divided American architecture into camp and non-camp. He focused on aestheticization and depolitization, then he relate camp to the formalism of the international style. Interestingly, Jenks pinned Venturi and Scott Brown as non-camp architects who, although incorporating pop and camp materials, had nothing to do with formalism and could even be considered as morally hot. Let's observe that Jenks seems to miss a bit the irony and the second degree of camp. Next slide, please. More relevantly, the critic C. Ray Smith, a graduate, a graduate from the Yale Architecture School, 
considered camp in architecture as a matter of sensibility in his book, Supermanerism, New Attitudes in Postmodern Architecture. He argued that educated people have long been confronted with the spectacle of consumerism, the obscenity of advertising and the vulgar transformation of the visual environment. As he summarized, artists, instead of being merely outraged or horrified by all of this, instead of rejecting it all as exclusively as possible, determine in their ideos fascination that the way to make those artifacts of our undesigned and cough Philistine everyday culture better was to make fun of them. Then, C.R.A. Smith, who had attended the presentation of the Las Vegas studio in January 1969, adds, it was a whimsical, humorous, and perversely imaginative to think that the architecture of Las Vegas and of Levitan were valid areas for investigation, as Dunnid and Robert did. They were right, but it was still a campy idea. At this stage, I believe it is important to challenge Sontag's statement that camp sensibility is disengaged and depoliticized. As a matter of fact, camp has been used since the 1950s to defend marginal cultural and social forms and behaviors. It flourished as a way to actively oppose the mainstream views of normality. More than others, the gay community has used it to confront heterosexuals with their prejudices. As Judith Butler observed in Gender Trouble, Kemp played a significant political role through its capacity to shake up preconceived ideas, to reverse understandings, and to exaggerate the artificiality of what dominant cultural players perceived as natural. Next slide. In a similar way, Denise and Bob challenge the norms. They undermine modernist orthodoxy by welcoming extravagant roadside constructions into the architectural repertoire. Denise, Denise did it too by redeeming the suburban home when she designed the learning from Lebiton studio in the 1970s. Far from frivolity and dandyism, Denise and Bob actually showed a new kind of commitment at the very moment social and political battles were losing intensity. They were more liberals than radicals, but by questioning the founding of good taste and acknowledging the popular culture, they opened up a new front. They campaigned for the democratization of architecture, singularly not from the top to the bottom, but from the bottom to the top. For Denise and Bob, being revolutionary for an architect did not, did not mean dreaming of a utopia, but rather showing empathy for people's true expectations and for the existing city as it is and as they like it. Next slide, please. In his book, No Respect Intellectuals and Popular Culture, Andrew Ross explains, unlike the traditional intellectual whose function is to legitimize the cultural power of ruling interest, or the organic intellectual who promotes the interest of a rising class, the marginal camp intellectual expresses his impotence as a dominated fraction of a ruling bloc as he distances himself from the conventional morality and taste of the ascendant middle class. It seems to me that Denise follows such a narrow and perilous path as she tried to change the representations and the practices of the architects on the everyday, everyday ground. Indeed, in the 1970s, she and Bob had to deal with a political, social, and economic context that, that was less and less favorable to the production of pure architecture. In order to change the built world around them, they decided to look at it with irony, to laugh at it, so they didn't cry, as Denise has confided to Stanislas Bonmos in 1975. To conclude, I would like to suggest that showing a camp sensibility much more committed than one could first think, Denise and Bob writing on Las Vegas expressed a melancholy that could be associated with the loss of a better world, but also the awareness that the one we live in can still be enchanting. In that way, I believe that learning from Las Vegas on other writings by Denise Scott Brown are in the present day powerful antidotes to the nostalgic and elitist views on architecture and urban design, but some that sometimes pervade today. <laughs>
Thank you very much for your attention. I am delighted to be here. Thank you, Frida. Thank you, Dean Burke, Surrey, and the team at Yale. And thank you, wonderful scholars with whom I get to be in conversation. Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi's consideration of contemporary art operates at the foundation of their practice. In learning from Las Vegas, works of pop art and artists are often elusive. Is that better? Andy Warhol's statement, I like boring things, and his Campbell soup cans provide cultural context for and formal affinities with the windows of Guildhouse. Roy Lichtenstein's comic inspired paintings, which for the architects represent emotional states rather than war or, ro or romance narratives, exemplify Pop's messaging, its capacity to achieve goals distinct from those of their media sources. There is one reproduction in the text, Alan Darkangelo's The Trip, whose title might be understood in multiple ways. Red arrow and yellow hand suggest conflicting instructions. A visual analog for the contradiction and disorientation on post-war highways and the necessity of prominent signage. Quote, today the, the crossroad is a clover leaf. To turn left, the driver must turn right. With no time to ponder paradoxical subtleties, he relies on signs to guide him enormous signs in vast spaces at high speeds, end quote. As the authors established in the opening pages, quote, for the artist creating the new may mean choosing the old or the existing. Pop artists have relearned this. Our acknowledgement of existing commercial architecture at the scale of the highway is within this tradition, end quote. Much of my scholarship over the last 20 years has explored the centrality of pop art to the architect's projects in the 1960s and 70s. My contribution to the recent volume in this talk today focus on ideas from Scott Brown. As Venturi confirmed, quote, pop art was very important for its strong association with the ordinary. Denise knew this earlier than I did. She understood the relevance of pop art before I did, end quote. While they incorporated paintings and prints and photographs, as we'll see shortly, into publications, not just learning from Las Vegas, sculpture was equally, if not more, important, especially that of Klaus Oldenburg, who began representing familiar subjects from consumer culture in the early 1960s, extending them to larger scales, and then envisioning them as public monuments, some at architectural proportions by the end of the decade. He was, as Scott Brown told me in our first talk in February, 2003, quote, the closest to us because he deals with objects, end quote. While Oldenburg's hamburgers enter learning from Las Vegas even more briefly than Warhol's cans and Lichtenstein's comics, the influence of his objects and of pop art generally becomes especially clear in studio programs and work topics designed by Scott Brown and pointed passages that reveal her perspicacious response to his career. In her illuminating analysis of urban design on pop art permissiveness and planning, Scott Brown interpreted the turn toward objective methods and popular subjects with a synthesis of historical context and openness to diverse sources. Pop art guided broad perspectives on current discourse as she encouraged urban designers, quote, to look for new, more receptive ways of seeing the environment, end quote. Ed Ruscha's black and white photographs illustrate the essay starting with the Los Angeles parking lot, followed by an Arizona gas station. These photographs come from two of the artist's typological books whose content was fueled by the automobile oriented landscape. The final image shows apartments alternating stone and stucco facades with applied ornament, a cursive script with creative spelling, Fountain Blue, BLU, cleverly adjusting the street's name and potentially adding, certainly conjuring a historical referent. This image relates to both research studios at Yale. It epitomizes conclusions about commercial symbolism in Las Vegas in 1968 
and anticipates questions about residential architecture in Levittown in 1970. Scott Brown's focus on Ruscha may reflect his recent participation in the Las Vegas studio. Yale students visited him in Los Angeles and in Las Vegas transferred his methods from every building on the Sunset Strip to their research agenda. While the folded format and incredible length, 27 feet, of the book did not translate, their photographs retained Ruscha's approach to capturing facades on opposite sides of the street, suturing images together and reproducing them in rows to recreate their relative positions including, as had Ruscha, minimal textual additions, for them casinos and cross streets. In Learning from Las Vegas, pairs stretch across four pages, a comprehensive representation of structures and symbolism along the strip. For Scott Brown, Ruscha functioned as exemplar for his subject matter and deadpan style. In this article, she set her discussion of Ruscha within general thoughts on pop. Her paragraph begins with Robert Rauschenberg and Boyd Lichtenstein, whose designs appeared, she tells us, on covers of Time Magazine. And she brings in Alan Darkangelo in a comparison of his highway paintings to Ruscha's parking lots, both unusual viewpoints on an open, seemingly unoccupied space striking in their balance of commercial cues and geometric abstraction. Scott Brown's most comprehensive analysis of Ruscha's work, this text clarifies the prominence and acceptance of pop artists. As she would repeat in learning from pop in 1971, quote, the urgency of the social situation and the social critique of urban renewal have been as important as the pop artists in steering us toward the existing American city and its builders, end quote. This assertion connects critique to content as would Oldenburg's art more securely. This photograph from an early book on pop demonstrates Oldenburg's literal embrace of the kind of signage that already drew Scott Brown's attention. The passing reference to Oldenburg and learning from Las Vegas indeed emphasizes a connection between signs and sculptures, identifying the Roman centurions at Caesar's palace as lacquered like Oldenburg hamburgers. Surprising to me in ways I will attempt to unpack, this comment hints at Oldenburg's broader influence and Scott Brown's perceptive analysis of his sculptural practice and his position in the contemporary art world, most elaborate in the studio notes. The equation of sign and sculpture returns his subjects to their early, to their urban sources, as had Oldenburg playfully when he took a few soft sculptures on a tour of Los Angeles. Art historian John McCubrey had already made a similar point to that in Las Vegas in his catalog essay for the highway at Philadelphia's Institute of Contemporary Art in 1970, for which Scott Brown and Venturi wrote about urban development and design. And I'm showing here a tourist brochure uh, from Learning from Las Vegas, which I have always thought, especially with the candle in the lower left and the Thunderbird near the upper right, um, illustrates McCubrey's point. According to McCubrey, quote, for miles along the Las Vegas Strip, Disney's, Calder's, and Oldenburg's of the Young Electric Sign Company and its competitors hold the desert and distant mountains at bay. The allusion to Oldenburg in the book might call to mind two cheeseburgers with everything, dual hamburgers, hamburger popsicle price, and floor burger, all shown at the Green Gallery in 1962. This was the last of three exhibitions from the project that associated Oldenburg with pop art. Reliefs and three-dimensional objects first built from wire, plaster, and enamel, and later sewn in canvas, represented products from ads in newspapers and magazines, in window displays, and on posters and billboards in downtown Manhattan. Closely tied, I have ar argued elsewhere, to the city. The statement in, Las in learning from Las Vegas implied their three-dimensionality, commercial content, and large sizes scale arguably the most notable formal principle of his work, yet it emphasized surfaces, highlighting an element critical to the artist and indicative of his intentions toward embodied vision. 
as he clarified, quote, the soft sculpture and enamel sculpture are both shiny and they change when you walk, end quote. Oldenburg sculptures, hard and soft, promoted tactile engagement through uneven and malleable materials intensified with palpable pigment. And he solicited physical interaction in exhibitions that put them at arm's reach or on the floor with invitations to approach and touch, a priority he learned from living among urban transformations. With glossy paint and irregular forms, the objects seem responsive to our direct interventions and constant relocations, spatial and temporal. Oldenburg's observations and representations of downtown neighborhoods anticipate, though from a pedestrian perspective, those employed by architects and applied to Las Vegas. In the late, 19, in the late 1950s, he photographed views from the sidewalk raised tenements, rubble-strewn lots, storefronts, and signs, which inform the materiality and content of the store. A few sequential images capture trajectories of passers-by, those that show the artist's own subtle movements, parallel though modestly and less systematically, the representations of motion and learning from Las Vegas as successive alterations in otherwise consistent scenes convey physical displacements. We can see other ways that Oldenburg translated lessons from his urban paths to objects in the early 1960s if we look again at store sculptures, not least in the artist's insistence that they change when you walk. They also depicted eye clusters a term which he explained as, quote, a formal model for the kind of visual experience, fragmentation, simultaneousness, superimposition, end quote, to impart a sense of glancing at the details of architectural facades, their signs and windows while mobile. In sketches, overlapping partial distorted objects, here the American flag in the top right, shirt and tie along the top, price tag 39 cents at the center and toward the lower, lower left, appear in jumbled accretions, as did the reliefs in the first installation of the store. Oldenburg's eye clusters, I propose, find a conceptual equivalence in learning from Las Vegas. Quote, the emerging order of the strip is a complex order. It is not an order dominated by the expert and made easy for the eye. The moving eye in the moving body must work to pick out and interpret a variety of changing juxtaposed orders, end quote. Bet excuse me, between the Las Vegas and Levittown studios in 1969, Oldenburg's work became more accessible to general audiences in a major exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art and to those at Yale. In May, the same month, Scott Brown published the article on pop art, Lipstick Ascending on Caterpillar Tracks was installed at the heart of campus. Commissioned by the Colossal Keepsake Corporation, an organization of students, faculty, and alumni who came together to introduce revolutionary monuments to college camp campuses, the first by one of their own. With vibrant cosmetic pigment, whose original vinyl tip could be inflated, though you can probably see in the text that it was quickly replaced by a fiberglass version, and stylized vehicle treads. It suggested projection and progress in literal and symbolic terms, a radical recasting of the iconography of the adjacent World War I memorial. It was the artist's first built monument, an invented combination of ordinary objects. Art historian Vincent Scully said, quote, it shakes us up, makes us laugh, and catches us thereby, end quote. Grad student Stuart, Stuart Reedy, president of the corporation, called it an act of cultural and political protest. Oldenburg intended it as a podium for public speeches. While there were many national issues, including civil rights, gender equality, and anti-war movements, the latter with which it is most often associated, it could have provided a forum for more local concerns. The art and architect students were demanding curricular change and increased social responsibility. 
According to Reedy, they wanted, quote, a more inclusive approach and a greater concern for the street life of the city, end quote, for which Oldenburg and Scott Brown provided models and both made appeals through pop precedents. As Oldenburg shared in an interview in 1968, quote, a friend who is a student of architecture at Yale told me that the kind of objects I choose are the closest thing to symbols available in our time. Architects find it difficult to design monuments today, he said, because they can't find appropriate symbols, end quote. While I have not confirmed the identity of this friend despite my best efforts, I have believed him a student of Scott Brown and Venturi's. Their example of the quote, hamburger shaped hamburger stand, a current more literal attempt to express functionalism via association, end quote, bears an uncanny resemblance to floor burger, especially in black and white, I realize, as if evidence of the artist's own deliberations, quote, a monument can be anything. Why isn't this hamburger a monument? Isn't it big enough? I think of a monument as being symbolic and for the people and therefore rhetorical, not honest, not personal, end quote. Both publications from which I have drawn these quotations, Proposals for Monuments and Buildings, 1965 to 69, and the publication for the MoMA exhibition were on the, on the bibliography of the Levittown Studio. The notes for this course constitute Scott Brown's most incisive and extended analysis of Oldenburg's work. He figured into two project descriptions. The first required students to gather broad research on contemporary residential architecture. Quote, make a bibliography of sources on attitudes toward housing and get as many as possible into the art and architecture library. Range widely from Madison Avenue to the School of Business to local builders and their trade journals, to Life, Time, The New Yorker, to TV, to Oldenburg and Keenholz, end quote. The final assignment turned specifically to hamburgers. The Oldenburg interpretation, as it was titled, asked students to quote, do for housing what Oldenburg did for hamburgers, end quote. As Scott Brown has re recently mentioned, she had Florberger in mind, explaining, quote, if he had a way of artistically interpreting a hamburger, we as architects should be able to artistically interpret a suburban house, end quote. And I think this is worth reading almost in full. Oldenburg has essentially made us look at hamburgers in another way because he has portrayed them in an unusual way, big, lacquered, and in an art gallery. Does he hate them or love them and should we? Probably he feels some of both, but that doesn't matter, at least not yet. The first thing is the shift in vision and understanding which an Oldenburg can induce and the reinterpretation and reclassification of our cultural artifacts, which he provides. Second, in making popular art into high art, he legitimizes it for the culture vultures. The popular environment sp sprawl and strip is drastically in need of a similar service because pop is unacceptable until it hangs in the academy and only the artist can put it there. Until this happens, hardship will be wrought on people and the environment in the name of good architecture in the fight against aesthetic pollution. And critics will ask why after all good intentions, the beautified city should be so dull. Scott Brown recognized the significance the, of Oldenburg's transformations of common objects and his acceptance by, the, by New York's art world. She understood how Oldenburg's art expanded definitions and relaxed, even resisted conventions. She articulated his methods, size, surface, location, suggested personal perspectives and reinforced a non-judgmental approach and proposed implications of his sens sensorial, conceptual, and contextual demands. 
in language that underscores inclusiveness, how he has made us look. Her acknowledgement of the shift in vision and understanding signaled a common ground on which artists and architects alike considered perceptual experiences at the core of their creative and critical strategies. Just as it also recalled her goal of finding new, more receptive ways of seeing the environment in on pop art, permissiveness and planning. In that article, Scott Brown introduced the term strange, which she attributed to Gertrude Stein, some strangeness, something unexpected in sentence structure, Francis Bacon, strangeness in proportion, and Le Corbusier, a new subject, a shocking source, his grain elevators and ships. Each example, syntax, scale, subject, quote, rocks the artist from his aesthetic grooves and resensitizes him to the sources of his inspiration. It may be achieved by breaking rules as did the mannerists. Here the jolt comes from the unexpected use of a conventional element in an unconventional way, end quote. This point, this final point, a conventional element in an unconventional way characterizes pop art in learning from Las Vegas, quote, pop artists use unusual juxtapositions of everyday objects in tense and vivid plays between old and new associations to flout the everyday interdependence of context and meaning, giving us a new interpretation of 20th century cultural artifacts. The familiar that is a little off has a strange and revealing power." End quote. The central idea is revised from the Levittown studio notes from Oldenburg's reinterpretation and reclassification of our cultural artifacts and broadened to the pop artists as a whole. Thank you, Denise for the many times you have encouraged us to look and the many ways your work has rocked and resensitized us all. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite, um, oh, I'd like to invite Craig and Catherine uh, to join me up at the table. I hope that uh, Valerie will be able to join us too remotely. Um, I'll keep my fingers crossed. I hope we'll have questions from the audience uh, as well, but I'll kick things off uh, with uh, Denise Bush. Um, uh, Valerie referred to this more or less directly in, in his talk. That is the, the question of the politics of, of learning from Las Vegas. Uh, one of the early and persistent criticisms of this project uh, concerned with politics, or rather its self-conscious lack thereof. Uh, in other contexts, one might understand this kind of apolitical position to be inherently conservative, if not reactionary. Um, yet the project's aspirations to revolution, the various types of which our speakers uh, this afternoon have alluded to, uh, belie a decidedly different uh, attitude. Um, I was wondering uh, if each of you might speak um, in, in a little more depth to the question of politics in learning from Las Vegas, uh, in the work of Denise Scott Brown, um, uh, and in uh, the strain of architectural uh, thinking that she has. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Um, it's always fun to revisit learning from Las Vegas. I don't always read it. Um, I, um, in my current day job, which I forgot to mention earlier, I'm an assistant curator at the Art Institute. Um, and so revisiting learning from Las Vegas for the symposium in the first edition, it's not even the, it's like a footnote. It's more a description of the studio that lists all the students. And I hadn't come across this before, but the, the footnote says, this is a technical studio. Don't bug us for lack of social concern. We are trying to develop tools to be socially concerned planners and architects. Um, and I hadn't seen that before. And it, it just sort of spoke to me just because of the criticism you're raising about the lack of politics and learning from Las Vegas. In that, you know, even revisiting the book that, um, you know, Venturi, Scott Brown, and Eisenhower had a sense of what they could do, the limits of what they could do, and that they were working on tools. Um, but I think the point about polit politics is important. And I think also one of the things I'll mention, at least in 
in my essay for the volume and thinking about Denise Scott Brown and Johannesburg, it's more that um, really only in the past decade has she been um, much more vocal with her, the word choices she's using to describe um, enrolling at the University of Witwatersrand at a moment when apartheid is being formalized a, as a national policy. Um, because otherwise, when I go through her readings or her writings, you know, really from the 60s to the 90s, it's it's subtly in there, but it's not as direct as the past decade. So I think this sort of awareness um, is is coming much to the fore, um, even in the past decade for Scott Brown. So thank you for the question. Um, I, I may be taking it in a slightly different way than you intended. And some of what I'm going to say, I think has already come up. But one of the things that I was thinking a lot about when I was preparing for this talk and revisiting some of my other work and moments of the, the learning from Las Vegas text, I, I think about two things. One, I think that as a teacher, teaching one to see, teaching students really to look at something and to think about it objectively as much as possible. Um, I realize that there's a rhetoric um, attached to that too, but I think that's still radical. I think it's still a radical practice. Um, and it's one that in my classroom and I know the students who are joining us on Zoom will understand that. Um, and I was also struck when I was looking at, at passages between the 72 and 77 edition, and I have to say, I into the 72 edition uh, because of some of the experiential parts of it that I'm really, I'm invested in in my own thinking. Uh, but I think it was Denise who would ask for the 77 publication because she wanted it to be more accessible. She wanted it to be cheaper than the 72 edition. And I was struck when I was rereading that gender is added to the second one in ways, at least for me, I have missed in the 72 that's there. So the passage I read about the driver, I think I'm remembering this correctly, is he in the 72 edition, and it's he and she in the 77, uh, which I have to believe is result in Denise's edition. Um, and I would also add with learning from Las Vegas and politics, it's, it's not so much reading politics into learning from Las Vegas, but I think what I'm really excited for papers this afternoon on 40th Street and South Street is really seeing what were the tools that they developed in learning from Las Vegas, and then how did that affect the work that they were doing to be invested in communities and to change them at this dynamic moment in the various places that they worked as a studio and also um, as a firm of venture Scott Brown and Associates. Um, uh, Valerie, do you have anything else to add? I know you addressed the politics of uh, yeah learning from Las Vegas and Denise Scott Brown uh, a little bit in your talk already. Yeah. You, you hear me? You hear me well? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think one of the very important things is that uh, we should not, um, we don't have to take learning from Las Vegas uh, alone. I mean, it came in a context that was a very highly political context. Uh, I always uh, like to, to remind that every time the Venturis uh, doing something with learning from Las Vegas, Richard Nixon is elected as president of the United States, first in 1968, then 1972. So there is a whole context which is very toxic in the political debate. Then I think we can really understand the way Denise and Bob uh, protect themselves uh, as uh, academics first, and also as a professional, as architect professional. So all these things saying, don't bother us with social uh, message and political, I think we can really understand um, if we, we understand that the, the context was uh, very uh, political. And what is also very interesting is that the, the audience uh, uh, always thought the book was very political. Uh, they were attacked, uh, the book was embattled. Uh, Charles Moore was saying the book was embattled and it was embattled in a political sense. And, what I try to, to say, to explain today is that I think what is very interesting, it, it was a way to, um, to shift um, the, the ground where politics was happening. I think after 68, um, the, the, the social, uh, the, the, the class struggle is, is a bit fading away and the cultural uh, battles are really taking importance. And learning from Las Vegas is really at the forefront of the, a new cultural battle who I think start in the 1970s. Uh, 
and uh, and so I think this book is extremely political, <laughs> uh, even if um, uh, Denise and Bob uh, always try to protect the book and to protect themselves uh, about this. I do not agree. No, we okay. were very concerned socially, and what we were saying was that you you. We are extremely concerned about those things. That's why we are looking at pop art and why we are looking at the communication from Las Vegas because poor people have been, I was the one trying to help save South Street. I was working for black people who were poor people. I'd been doing that for years before in Africa too, in certain ways, not others. I was scared of the things like the trees and trials. They said they were the in fact, execute all those people in the treason trials. I was 17, I didn't want to be executed. But for all that, a lot of the question of social and um, physical and cultural is saying, these are things poor people like, people want to use. You can't scorn them. It's because of them we are interested in those things. And because of Hitler and because of the experience that I'd seen with my own family being killed in the Holocaust and all of that. So it's not a lack of social concern. It's a way of using what I'm learning. I hope to talk more about this later. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open it up to the crowd. If anybody in the audience has questions, I see one right down here in the front, Mary. Well, it's not really a question. I just wanted for those of you who haven't Oh, sorry. For those of you, I think Denise answered beautifully her position. But for those of you who haven't read it, there's an amazing, witty exchange between Ken Frampton and Denise Scott Brown in A Casabella, which I think we saw an image of in uh, uh, the lecture uh, by Valerie. And um, I would just encourage you to read it because you see two different views of politics. And I think that's what's important. It's not, is it revolutionary or not, but what kind of political position was being expressed? You can characterize it new left, old left, uh, Frankfurt School, American populist left, however you wanna look at it. But I would just encourage the audience to read, and Denise is at her wittiest best. I am good friends with Ken Frampton, but I thrill in reading her prose, making fun. Uh, anybody else? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll venture another one then. Um, uh, since we've been talking so much about how architects see, uh, how artists and architects learn to see uh, and through seeing uh, look at the world, I can't um, help but be struck by uh, the role that images and pictures play um, in all the talks uh, this afternoon and in every talk we see in our history and, and architecture departments. Um, and uh, the, especially the juxtaposition of images made possible by the PowerPoint, the kind of radical juxtaposition of many images at once we talk about that PowerPoint, um, uh, demands that we see things uh, in a certain light and can be, um, dare I say, a little manipulative. Um, I'm especially struck, um, uh, I don't mean to project this, uh, the term manipulative uh, on you, Fred, but especially struck by your use of images. Uh, today, talking about um, Denise Scott Brown's African view of Las Vegas um, and juxtaposing uh, the images of um, uh, vernacular houses in South Africa with images of the Vegas Strip, or um, in, an, in the context of the lecture on the work of Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, I'm struck by the sort of radical similarity, uh, the sort of uh, radical flatness of uh, surfaces in um, indigenous and vernacular architectures in South Africa with, let's say, uh, the very kind of uh, postmodernist approach uh, and use of flatness in the architecture. Um, can you speak a little bit uh, to that and how, um, how pictures, how seeing uh, contribute to the construction of the sort of narrative um, that you lay out here today? Sure. Um, I think what I find so uh, exciting to have the volume in my hands now. Um, 
is to read a contribution that was written by Robin Middleton with Mary McLeod that goes over um, and reviews this man-made Johannesburg exhibition. Because I think that question that you're asking about photographic practices is something that is there from early on and continues uh, throughout her life um, with Robert Scott Brown and then also here in Philadelphia. And so that sort of visual interest in documenting what you see is a constant and from early on, which I'm excited to see. I think there are images of the Man Major Hasburg exhibition, which I hadn't seen before. Um, and I think also Denise is working on a book um, that pu will publish a lot of the photographs that she's taken over the years. And I think the one point that I'll say just sort of um, uh, whether you know, if images are manipulative or not, like when I read about how Denise Scott Brown talks about um, the qu like quality of light or desert in Johannesburg in the high belt um, from her youth, I really see that shift from the 72 edition to the light blue cover in the 77 edition as a sort of visual experience of being in a broad daylit expanse with a clear blue sky in the background, and then you just come upon a, bill, a bright colored billboard. And so I see, that's how I see a lot of those connections of those personal affinities, right? That one might have and develop early on that sticks uh, with you, but in Denise's here too. Thank you. So one of the things that I'm thinking about um, um, from my own talk, the specific around this idea of manipulation, is, um, and I didn't say, I didn't go into this, but when we're talking about the main gallery, Soar, Oldenburg, um, and also the Soar, the, the second street, Soar installation, over the moon, a lot of the sculptures during, um, during the institutions. And we know, or we think we know from some of the existing photographs, that especially of the main gallery, photographers moved some of those. Um, so there's, a, there's, I think the most famous photograph, in fact, of the Green Gallery is one from Rudy Burkhardt, he took the hammer out. And I spent lots of time with um, the assistants in uh, the Oldenburg studio trying to figure out why he was it there. And it was there to give more space to the works we show. Uh, and it's one that I did show has pencils, and you, and you remember, I think these shove, many of these are shoved toward the walls, which is not the way I think it, it appeared in most of um, for, for most of the duration of that um, of that exhibition. So the thing that I thought a lot about um, is also to bring to bring you back to um, to Denise's ideas about objects. I think about the sign by exhibition. And so much of their work seems to be about the experience or about trying to use images to convey an experience of a place. Um, and if, if you can conjure the Science of Life exhibition, um, there's a room where they borrow the billboards and are the McDonald's um, sign. We saw, that, we saw that earlier. And so that entire, so most of that installation was indeed the artifacts of commercial culture, sculpturally. Um, and the thing, this is one of my favorite um, ideas that I, that I ran across in the archives. There was, they intended to use root shape in that exhibition. They had planned in that room a corner that would be recreated um, using a, a reverse mobile technology, you can imagine this, about a 40 foot corner that one would enter. And the images from the Las Vegas strip will be moving in the direction opposite the one that you'd be walking through the exhibition. So we have simulated in photographs the experience of the strip while amidst all of these three-dimensional signs. And I, and I always love the idea of the confrontation of those two ways of thinking and ways of experiencing. Um, it's my understanding that technologically and financially, because correct me if I'm wrong, that was that ever materialized, but it seemed like a maybe brilliant translation of what they've been working on and thinking through in, in the studio into that particular 
Any questions from the audience? No. Oh, there's one in the back. I think that you several people have touched on this sort of question of the images and the way that we like perceive the urban space and the built environment. Um, and I was sort of reflecting during the talk, talking about Rocher's stitched together images and these sort of large uh, panoramic views of the city. Um, and I was sort of interested by the technology that was used then versus like what we have available now with Oldenburg having to walk, take two separate frames of the city to portray his movement versus it's very easy for someone now to take out their phone and stream their entire life. Um, how important do you think that technology is and the way that you had to capture things for digital in shaping our perceptions and the way that this sort of study of space in Las Vegas and elsewhere was framed? So thanks for the question. Um, I think I mean I think that I think it's I think it's a good question. It's something that I grapple with thinking through how Oldenburg in particular how his photographs translated into ultimately into sculptural production. Um, and I think it, for me it comes and you're right. Technology today allows for a really different, um, a really different kind of um, a visual experience. But I think it's and looking back to my my clinging to the seventy two urban because there's something to me about the movie sequence in the two page spread that gives that gives a much better sense of the strip and the experience along the strip than. The time and it's four frames. I mean, maybe somebody else knows this better than I do. Even that translates to the 77 version. So I guess it isn't just the, to me, it's just the technology used to render those images. It's also the technology of the book format. And obviously, we shape like with that and we give up 27 feet of a single strip, of course, to show the two miles of the strip that he had, um, that he had used to move a motorized camera. Um, to to capture. So I think it's also it's an original production, but I think it's also the original publication. You know, there's a there's another difference I think between the uh, I know it's uh, between the uh, so Rouchet's approach to um, the kind of long elevation um, of photographs, I think in the car, which are more or less seamlessly stitched together, but in learning from Las Vegas, we get these glitches. So Rouchet is an obvious point of reference, um, uh, but it's giving a little bit of David Hockney too, right? Where Caesar's palace glitches and you see it twice, but that the, there's a, a kind of awareness of the technological limitation or a sort of uh, an amplification of the scenes that in those show, which I think is pretty interesting. I don't know if there's anything to that beyond um, the fact that these were done by students after a case beer or two, um, as opposed to that Rouchet, the kind of uh, hood mounted 35 millimeter. So I think, I think Rouchet's is fleshier than it might have been. Okay. Um, I think you're just sure you can see the frames, there's some overlapping, there's some missing. Uh, I think I think in some ways, if, um, if you hadn't seen the detail more from the studio, I don't think it's apparent in the location because they're relatively small. And I think it's harder to see some of that, some of that advantage. Any other questions from the audience? Oh, Denise, um, would you like to? Um, Jump in. Yes, I could hear. Um, things are much more complex, I think, than you realize around South Africa. And there I was. I was very bullied for being Jewish. I was hearing of my grandmother's relatives being killed by Hitler. I was being taught I'm a member of a master race. I was surrounded by refugees of all sorts. Um, we weren't allowed to have brown and black people as social friends. My very good friend here, Shilpa, who grew up in Africa too, we were saying in South Africa, we could never have met. But 
the point was that all of that was happening and a child can get rather confused by all that too. And so it wasn't simple, but I was aware that I had Serbians coming to our house, Chinese people, Swedish people, German Jews, a great many, and a string of music teachers, each of them was some other profession which did not get reciprocity in South Africa, so they were teaching music. At my school, there were lots and lots of anti-Semites, also some Jews, a very liberal um, staff and faculty, and again, refugees, um, children who could be living, being part of the British um, Raj, you could say, in the Middle East who fled. They fled to South Africa and there they were in our school suddenly and then out again rather suddenly. I had a friend like that. I had an evacuee friend. Um, and all of that, um, I remember one, she, they were Canadian and they were in Japan and her father was put in a concentration camp and killed. And the mother and child managed to get into Africa. And our school gave the mother a job as a music teacher. They lived with the faculty there. And if she got cross with someone, she used to say, and if her father died, I wouldn't even cry. So then we came, came the news and the school said, listen to the, the, the broadcast on it and you may be late at school later. That was telling us everything about the Holocaust. I read and read and read about the Holocaust and I was about 13. Um, I came home to, to um, after school and there was my grandmother who was German speaking. They didn't speak Yiddish, they spoke German. Um, on the other side from Lithuania, they spoke Yiddish. But she was sitting there listening to Hitler on the, it, it's called the shortwave radio. And Hitler was shouting, 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 and there's my grandmother coming up and saying, liar, liar, liar. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother had, had to be um, adopted by family members when her father died going to Africa to try to haul them all out of poverty, and he got yellow fever and died. My, they, she later went to Africa, and they grew up in lion country. My mother had a great love of African culture. She spoke Northern Cinderbelli is called. I speak a little. My father speak a little. When we had a house in Johannesburg, um, father sent their, their teenage sons to work for us because there were enough people speaking Cinderbelli there and they could learn English. It was a, a funny situation in many respects. And then I had an art teacher. She was a um, Dutch Jewish refugee. And in in school, I learned to paint thatch cottages in Surrey. But in that place, she said, paint what's around you or you won't be creative artists. And I thought, what I would like to be around me is all that culture. I wanted to be there at the Congress of Vienna when I learned about it. But I had a history teacher who came from London School of Economics. She'd been in the army. She was discharged there. She was a funny woman. But um, she taught us the Boer War from Kruger's point of view. And these things were terribly important. Then when I got to, to America, when I was in, South, in England, people said, oh, well, you're from that terrible country. And I would answer back and say, you know, you're doing some things here too. But my friends there were from the socialist um, movement. They got major scholarships to the AA, and they were poor boys. And, the ones who were the original AA people, they kind of wouldn't talk to us. And then people said, well, the English have um, looser requirements for gardeners and, and colonials. And that's the way they treated us. But I learned a lot from the Smithsons. Um, I think Alice the Smithson was one of the most god-awful people possible. And she was probably Jewish, that's my feeling. But she could be so rude. But I, I'm very much involved in housing in South Africa and then later in England. And I got to Philadelphia and there was Herbert Gans. He'd been a refugee in London, and, but he was from Germany. And this here was, again, the social system and the place of the, horror, of the Holocaust and all of these things. And then I would argue about him and he'd be surprised at 
how patriotic I was for South Africa. It didn't, but when I say xenophobe, I don't mean that I am for those things. I mean, I'm for what black people are doing there and what, what's happened to them, I'm trying to make up for. And Robert and I were highly, highly idealistic about going back to South Africa. And David Crane, who you haven't mentioned at all, but he introduced me to studio the way we taught it. Except I'd also learned it at King's Mead College when I was seven. They had the equivalent of research studios for little kids in elementary school, and that was called Deweyism. So we had that. Um, our teacher there, she made sure the Jewish kids got an education. We had Miss Cohen there, and if we had any needs, we can go and talk to her too. And Miss Cohen would not give um, uh, penalties for people. You don't get an order mark from Miss Cohen. She would not do that. Why? She believed you should be good for the sake of being good. Wow, did you hear that in into the heads of those little kids? And so and there's an, another one who said, um, what, what kind of politics is South Africa? And we said, well, it's a democracy. She, she said, no, it's not a democracy. And we said, but our daddies and mommies vote. Yes, your daddies and mommies vote. And other people's daddies and mommies don't vote because they're black and brown. Look at the faces of those little kids. They understood so well. And I hear what everyone is saying about don't hurt those little white Christian kids. The hell with that. The little white Christian kids were learning fast and liking to be taught those things. So there's so much like that. I still speak some Sindabeli. I can do a little of that. Iniwenafuna. What's mean? What do you want? Etc. So, and by the way, then I was very much involved Thank in. Thank you so um, much, Denise. Okay, enough. I'll do some <laughs> more later. Never, never enough. Uh, never enough from you. But um, uh, we're just about out of time. We might have uh, a time for yes. one small question from the audience. Cree, you're always good for a question. Oh, up here in the. Oh, can you wait for the mic? I was in the studio, and that was 1968. Everything was politics. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just that is clear. And Denise brought her own intensity of the politics to it. So it was a learning process. It was a, it was a study process. It was a planning process, and planning was about solving big, bigger, larger problems and buildings. And that's one of the values of that studio was the rigor that Denise brought to that. She gave us the roadmap and the assignments of what to do. It's her structure. Studio was where you formed ideals. Thank you very much. Uh, look and see what what um uh, what Jim Yellen says at the end. He he that documents yes. It, uh, it's it looks like you were talking, but I think you're muted. <laughs> Well, I'll talk about it later, but remind me, because studio was a major ideal forming thing for everyone in, in planning school, not architecture, our planning school, and the architects and non-architects there grew idealistic through studio. All right. Uh, that seems like an okay. excellent place to wrap up this panel. Thank you so much, Denise. Uh, thank you, Valerie, Fred, uh, Catherine, uh, for your contributions.